Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Julie Garden Robinson, and I'm your host for today's Field to Fork webinar. This is brought to you by North Dakota State University Extension. This is actually the ninth year we've done the series, and we're really glad you've been joining us. Maybe this is your first time, or maybe you've been to all of the webinars so far. We have archived all of the webinars from previous years, and the link is on our Field to Fork webinar page. And I want to give a special welcome to our watch parties. Welcome, everyone. We also are providing a certificate of attendance on our website, and it is posted with the recording, which will come out in a couple days. The next slide shows the upcoming webinars. So you can take a look. We hope you join us for these as well. The next slide shows the webinar controls. And because of our large number of participants, we invite you to post your questions and comments in the chat. Let's practice finding and using the chat box. Some of you already did. You can ignore the Q&A box. We're not going to use that. We're going to have you put your questions for Harleen in the chat box. So type your city and state where you are right now. The next slide provides an acknowledgement. So as you work on putting your city and state in, I have a special request. This program is sponsored in part with grant funding from the USDA's Agricultural Marketing Service through the North Dakota Department of Agriculture, actually. And I will ask all of you to complete the short online survey that will be emailed right after today's webinar. And as a thank you, we are continuing to provide prizes to the lucky winners of the random drawings. So be sure to include your complete address. And by the way, you will need to scroll down to today's date and speaker's name because we're combining our data from 2023 and 2024. So the 2023 dates are listed first. So scroll down a little bit and click on that button that corresponds to the 2024 date. And with that, our next slide is a welcome to today's webinar and our speaker. I'd like to tell you a little bit about Dr. Harlene Hatterman Valenti. She was born in Northeast Nebraska and raised on a crop and animal farm. She came to NDSU in 2000 as an assistant professor in the High Value Crops Project. So she has spent more time in North Dakota than Nebraska. She has conducted research on approximately 20 different crops, but allium crops have been most predominant during her 23 plus years at NDSU. And I have a beautiful blooming bulb behind me right now that's quite fragrant. So I'm looking forward to spring and some of the bulbs that pop up. So welcome Harleen and I'll, you can take it away. Okay, so that is wonderful. So today um, the, the topic is how to grow garlic and other alliums. And I only have about 45 minutes, so I'm not going to touch on a lot of alliums um, uh, because there are way too many that uh, it would take days to go and discuss them all. Uh, but so today I'm just going to talk about three of them, uh, garlic dry bulb onions, and leeks. And those are the big three that we can really grow quite well here in North Dakota. So with that, I'm going to start with a little bit about um, garlic. Well, first I'll just talk about the, the genus Allium. It is one of the largest flowering plant groups in the Amaryllis family. And that's what Julie was talking about. She probably has an Amaryllis that is what its common name is, uh, bulb flowering right now. The family name is actually Amaryllidaceae. Um, and this consists of hundreds of wild and cultivated scented bulbous herbs. And the three that I have talked about are um, well known. There's, there's also a lot of Chives, for example, is another one, but there's even herbaceous ornamentals that um, grow quite well in North Dakota that um, Chinese garlic, for one, and ornamental onion uh, that uh, grow quite well and 
prolifically as herbaceous ornamentals. But today we're going to talk about more of the culinary ones. And and to start with, um, garlic, you know, it can be used for a whole bunch of different things. Um, I have a graduate student that is looking at uh, the cultivars and some of the information that I'm going to provide is from his trial to give you an idea of which cultivars do better in North Dakota than um, other places. But I also have a graduate student that is looking at alliums for their um, health attributes. Uh, we know garlic has a lot of health attributes, and I'll talk about that in a little bit, but she's looking at um, how some of these other alliums, leeks, um, green onions, um, dry bulb onions, and boy, now I lost my thought on the third one. Um, it'll come to me probably when I get to the end, but she's looking at more of the health attributes, and that's because a lot of these uh, alliums have these bioactive co uh, components. In garlic, it's allicin and allylin, and actually allylin is the precursor to allicin. So uh, most of the, um, the health attributes has to do with this sulfur compound of allicin, which is the most predominant in garlic. But garlic also has uh, G glutamylocysteine, sorry, a mouthful, and polyphenolics. And we've been looking in collaboration with um, Dr. Kalita Shetty on um, just the, the health benefits of the polyphenolics um, with type 2 diabetes. So, um, Sidra's whole research is looking at um, the four alliums for that. Um, as far as uh, the amount of production of garlic, the United Nations Food and Agricultural so Organization has uh, estimated that on an annual basis, there's about 11 million tons of garlic produced. And that's just on 2.5 million acres. Um, that's worldwide. That isn't the United States. Actually, in the United States, we import a lot of our garlic, and that's because of the uses and effectiveness of it treating uh, many different cancers and diseases. And so the consumption has increased faster than actually the production has increased. So in the United States, especially, we're really importing quite a bit of um, forgot to start up my little thing. Well, I'll look at time, make sure I don't run over. Um, importing much of the garlic. So now let's go in a little bit and get started on the production and management. Um, garlic grows best in a, a well-drained, sandy, clay loam soil. So a little bit heavier soil. And actually, we have a study where we're uh, trying to see how these cultivars compare um, at our horticulture research site, which is more of a sandy loam and comparison to on campus here where we're in the Red River Valley, we have a clay soil. Uh, and so we're, we're testing that. Uh, we planted those last fall and we'll hopefully have some results come this uh, kind of late July. Um, period when we harvest. Um, soil pH is best around 6 to 6.8, uh, but I know we have a little bit higher um, pH out at the horticulture research farm. It's more of a 7.2, maybe 7.4, and we haven't had any problems um, with that. So um, one nice thing about garlic is it it's, it, it's a very uh, adaptable plant in most cases. As far as nutrition, you know, we want to overall apply between 70 and 125 pounds of nitrogen, 150 pounds of um, phosphorus, and a, excuse me, about 100 pounds 
of potassium. Now that will depend on your soil test and what previous crop you had. And uh, so, um, but it's also important that we don't put all that nitrogen down at, for, at one time. We really wanna spoon feed the nitrogen. Um, and so that should be split into approximately 25 pounds before planting and then side dress around 20 pounds every three weeks. And then we want to make sure we stop four to six weeks before harvest um, because we really want that plant not to keep trying to grow and produce. It has to... Um, you know, it, it's a rather long season the way it is. We need that dry down. We have to go and cure those uh, uh, bu um, bulbs. And, and, and it also helps if you shut that off so that you don't it in the preservation. Otherwise, uh, your bulbs will deteriorate quicker if we keep on fertilizing right to the end. Um, as far as irrigation, I think drip irrigation works the best. Yeah. With drip irrigation, you can avoid some of those uh, leaf diseases that um, all alliums can get. Uh, and uh, with drip irrigation, then it's easy enough to um, put on about an inch a week if it's getting... Um, towards the end and the plants are bigger, you might need to go and put two e two inches a week when it's um, some of those hot days, especially like last year, we had June weather, no, July weather was in June. So it was really, really hot. We had a, a number of hundred degree days um, and alliums in general do not really like those hot days. So it's best that we do whatever we can to go and, and help them through those kind of periods. Now, there are three different types of garlic. You have your um, elephant garlic, uh, soft net um, garlic, and hard net garlic. We in, in the northern part um, do best with hard net cultivars and, and um, so and but there's a lot of there's a, also then subgroups but hard neck by far are are the only ones that we grow in North Dakota so when do we get started well we're past that time already we needed to do that this last fall approximately six to eight weeks before that ground freezes. Um, and we actually have another study where we're looking at, you know, what is the optimum time? Because there hasn't been any research on that for um, garlic. And, and so I'd rather have us do some trial and error and figure out when's the best time uh, to have, um, to go and uh, transplant your cloves of garlic um, than to have someone else go in and trial around and find out um, that through more air than um, anything else. Um, spacing, your rows spacing should be anywhere from 12 to um, 36 inches or one to three feet. And then um, between the cloves, you want somewhere between three and six inches. They kind of like to be kind of close together, but you need to go and give them enough room so that um, they aren't pushing against each other and deforming each other. So depth um, is three to four inches deep. And, and so you see the picture and in which they've just kind of marked out the row, then they'll go and cover that with soil. You can do that, or you can go and just actually, if you have a well-tilled soil, you can probably just push them down to that depth. Another way of looking at it is that the top of the clove has to be twice the depth of the clove height. So if your clove was about one and a half inches uh, tall, then you want three inches um, be above that tip of that clove. Of course, um, we need to mulch 
in this uh, climate that we have. Actually, one time I was growing some and uh, I thought, well, the previous year, generally we have plenty of snow. And I said, oh, they'll be fine. I won't have to go and, and get some straw and mulch them. And sure enough, that was the fall that we had the really cold weather before we got the insulation from the snow. And so the following spring, um, most of them did not emerge. Uh, they, In fact, they just, because of that cold injury, they just rotted in the soil. So you want four to six inches of straw. And the nice thing about that is... Uh, you know, having that straw through the winter, protecting it, um, you can then leave it there and it provides uh, weed control, not allowing a lot of those annual weeds to get enough sunlight to go and germinate. So it it, it provides weed control as well. And that is always a, a good thing um, because there's not a lot of way... Um, easy ways to go and for weed control usually it's by hand weeding uh, the roots are rather shallow and you really don't want to go and disturb the roots so um, uh, the mainly it's been hand weeding for for especially for a homeowner I think if we were to have a com big commercial grower then they would have put down their um, pre-emergence herbicide um, way before uh, the uh, garlic or the weeds emerged. So let's go on. Okay, some more on the production and management. So um, garlic will flower and these uh, that flowering stem is called a scape. And that must be removed because if you don't remove that and you allow the garlic to flower, then it's taking away nutrition from that bulb and those cloves and putting it towards that flower stalk and that flower. So you you remove the scapes and they can be consumed or you if you have a farmer's market, you can sell them. You can make them into a whole bunch of different things. I'm sure Julie has um, all kinds of recipes for scapes. Uh, anything from a pesto to um, just uh, pan uh, frying them can be done. Um, and so when you do that, then the next sequence of what happens is it's time to go and harvest. And you're going to go and harvest them when there's about six brown leaves or 60% of those leaves turn brown, I should say. Um, unlike, well, they do like onions. They'll actually, that stem will kink over. Uh, but you generally want to do that before. You don't want to wait that long because then that plant is also over mature. And especially if you're going to go and try to utilize any of those cloves to plant the following year, or if you want some long storage, um, they're going to ha have poor quality. So when 60% of the leaves turn brown, uh, you can either go and try to um, pull and twist. But I really think the best thing is to have a, like the picture shows, have some kind of a fork or a shovel or something to help dig those because I have gone and um, thought I could just pull them out and um, uh, no, I'm missing part of the the bulb. So um, I just try to, I use a shovel and help to help dig them up. Well, after that, um, just like other alliums that you want to um, maybe store or even if you were going to use them um, shortly, you need to do some curing. And uh, it's best if you avoid trying to cure these outside in full sun, because a lot of times you can have problems with sun scald on those. So um, indoor at a temperature of around 75, 80 degrees Fahrenheit. And you can see as a picture, they have them in these little netted bags so that they can have some air circulation. Uh, and then 
well, actually, after one to two weeks, then you cut off the stems and you can then continue to store them this way. Um, and if you do in those kind of situations, then they'll be able to go and be stored for one to two weeks. If you want longer storage, you need to have them at a refrigerated temperature with relatively low um, relative humidity, and then you can go and, and store them. Um, if you're a lot of garlic growers will go and um, use their own cloves for next uh, for the planting in the fall. Um, and if you're going to do that, you have to make sure that you um, store those cloves that you're going to use for your seed at around 50 degrees Fahrenheit with that relatively low um, relative humidity. If you don't, if you go at temperatures less than 50, that hastens the breaking of dormancy. So you're going to end up uh, maybe having a longer shoot and it's really going... I mean, you don't want that shoot really above ground um, in the fall. So you're trying to plant it so that it gets a start, but you don't want it above ground. Um, and it's going to be difficult to do that when if it breaks dormancy early. Likewise, if you go and uh, store them at a much warmer temperature, greater than 65, that actually will go and delay the sprouting and thus... I'm going to also throw things out of whack because you really want to have those come up in the spring because they don't do really well in really hot, hot temperatures. Uh, that um, And so if you have that earlier emergence in the spring, they'll get mature and you won't have to worry about that. See you on my time. Okay. So... Um, now I'm going to just talk a little bit about some of the cultivar or the cultivar trial that Stephen is doing. And so he's looked at these 29 cultivars and you'll see that some of them say 2021 and have the same name. And, and that's because we're actually um, using the seed, seed, I guess the cloves that, that we planted in 2021, seeing if there are certain cultivars that do better, that um, are more adapted to our uh, environmental conditions that would work better for someone who who is trying to go and use their own seed and continue to use their own seed or maybe sell um, garlic and so that's why those say 2021. Um, as far as then results, so this is uh, the results that Stephen got uh, from 2023. And he at initially he was looking at uh, the number of leaves that are produced because um, more leaf production just means there's more photosynthates that go into that bulb. So help that bulb um, get larger. And of course, that's what we want. And when you look at this, this is 30 and 45 uh, days after they emerged from the soil. And we see here that, you know, we have a, a number of them that are doing well, both uh, they are producing around six leaves um, at 30 days and at 45 days, they're right up around nine days. Um, one in particular went from only producing about five leaves um, at 30 days and really shot up the leaf production that was Yukon, Ukrainian red. Um, and by um, 45 days, it was up to nine leaves. When we looked at um, then 60 and 80 days after emergence, uh, the order hasn't really changed too much. Uh, there was, you know, they really didn't go and do a lot of, a lot more growth, except for like Ukrainian red. It um, did quite well in that um, it can, you know, continue to go, produce some leaves so that by 60 days, it was at um, 
11 and just a little bit higher at 80 days in in comparison to a lot of these others that stayed around that nine area. Uh, another one that was the Deerfield Purple 2021 cloves and it again jumped up from having around nine to right up there to uh, 10, 10 and a half leaves. So there was then a number of these that just, you know, they, after 45 days, they really didn't change much in, in their leaf production. Oops, there we go. As far as average scape length, what we were seeing is that, you know, um, the ones that were producing more scapes or longer scapes generally are more adapted to the environmental conditions that we have here in North Dakota. Um, our best was Dakota white, but statistically, because these other letters also have an A, or these other cultivars also have an A associated with them, there was no statistical differences in uh, the average scape length for those cultivars. When we look at average scape weight, again, we had a few more. So um, there's a number of those that went and didn't have the longest scape length, but they were probably thicker. Thus, they had uh, similar weights. And you can see uh, those seven right there that were um, for average scape weight. Now, this um, average bulb diameter, um, again, I, I should have probably earlier talked about what the scale is. Here, this is in millimeters, but really the what I'm trying to get across is you can see how uh, the diameter went from these, which were all statistically the same, having the largest diameter to those that had um, were statist statistically the same for having a rather small diameter bulbs. And that then, when we look at average bulb weight, which a lot of times um, is, is how they're sold, uh, we see here that we had three of them that had, um, the, that had the heaviest weight. Um, German White had by far the, the heaviest weight, but Georgian Fire and Music were statistically the same for weights. In opposition to that, we, we now know that, um, or are pretty sure, we'll find out with our second year of data um, this year when we harvest, but we have a, a pretty good idea that uh, um, Purple, White Spring, Chestnut Red, Yugoslavian, Ukrainian Red, which is kind of unique. Well, um, that was 2021. Spay, Deerfield, German Red, and Italian Lola Canono um, really had, you know, most of those had smaller bulbs, but they also had very small weight for um, for um garlic. So in conclusion, the average number of leaves um, was similar for all these cultivars until about 60 days after they emerged from the ground. And then after that, then Ukrainian red really took off and it produced the highest number of leaves. However, that wasn't associated with um, with bulb diameter or bulb weight for that cultivar. Um, when we're talking about scapes, Dakota white and German white produced the longest and heaviest scapes respectively, while this Italian Lyo Kono uh, and White Spring did not even produce scapes. When we're talking about um, the bulbs then, there was numerous cultivars that produced bulbs that had a diameter of approximately 2.4, 2.5 inches. 
but only German white had the bulbs that weighed over 2.5 ounces. And so by far was the superior cultivar that we tested. And we tried to find every cultivar around um, that was available in the U.S. through numerous uh, uh, garden supply catalogs. And so, um, so German white appeared to be the most adapted to the North Dakota environmental conditions, while um, there was two that uh, were the least and were would not be worth the time to go and put into your garden. Okay, so now we're going to go and move on to onion basics in a little bit. I'm going to probably have to hurry up on this with onions. Um, so garlic's a perennial, and if you didn't go and harvest your garlic, it would come up again, um, And but that would not go and, and behoove you to go and, and because it's not ornamental looking at all. Um, and, and so uh, it also would then, the, all of those cloves would try to come in that one bunch, which would also defeat the purpose of growing garlic. But onions, on the other hand, they're a biennial. And so they need two years before they flower which is important to know for some aspects of why you have flowering. Um, so they also have a, these concentric swollen leaf bases and that the, the leaves emerge from the center. So the oldest leaf is here, the newest leaf is gonna come from there. And bulbing is, is determined by the photo period and temperature. And that's important because the bulb size and the rate of bulb development depends on the size of that plant when bulbing starts. So you have a larger plant when it starts and you have good temperatures, um, then you'll have um, really a good size onion bulb that you will harvest. So, some of um, a little bit of information on you know these uh, various vegetables that have storage organs and how they respond to photo period. So we have some that are classified as day neutral. They don't care what you know how long a day is or how short the day is, and that's carrots, beets, turnips, and radishes. So they're classified as day neutral. You plant them, and when they get you know, as they mature, that storage organ will get bigger. However, onions and garlic are long day. And, and so they, that is triggered by um, their flowering or their storage. The bulbing is actually triggered by long days. There are some exceptions, but it's still considered a long day. And I'll talk to you a little bit about that. Um, on the other hand, we have short day um, vegetables, potatoes, sweet potatoes, yams, and cassavas that actually the, the tubers um, start to form in response to short days. So just a little bit of more um, information than maybe you wanted to know. There are different onion types, but I'm thinking I'm going to run out of time, and so I'm going to kind of just pass over this um, because really um, you're going to order what's available in, in a uh, or what's available in the store or through a catalog and that's already been kind of um, they've kind of tested these cultivars for various areas. Other classifications include um, skin color. Of course, you've probably seen that in the store where you can buy reds, whites, or yellow um, according to the mildness or pungence, pungency. Um, the yellows that we are accustomed to growing for storage are much more pungent and, uh, and usually the ones that do not store well are much more milder in taste. 
Um, they can be categorized also according to their shapes. Now here's where, you know, I said they're a long day for that, for the bulbing. But within that, um, they, this is so crazy. You know, they'll still go and say you have short day, intermediate day, and long days. But they're all long days because you can see um, the short day ones for bulbing is 12 to 13 hours of day length. The intermediate need 13 to 14 hours. And the long days need 14 to 16 hours before they start to bulb. And you, um, you know, those short and intermediate ones are, are really for, uh, I, I'd say, probably Kansas on down. And, and the short ones are Texas, Florida area. Okay, sets versus seed. You know, um, really sets have higher vigor and in especially in less favorable spring conditions so they're going to take off quicker um they also provide a more consistent sta stand establishment but with that they're you're they're more expensive in comparison to seed if you bought a dozen sets versus 12 seeds it there's quite a difference there uh, another thing about the sets is they're earlier at maturing and they require a shorter growing season because with the sets, you generally already have um, four to five leaves in that set. And so you see this picture here and um, the sets you can see are so much further ahead of the seed. In North Dakota, um, commercially, we generally uh, plant uh, just because of the cost of, of the sets. And um, since I don't think anyone's going to be doing this, and this is available in the handouts, I'm just going to go and, and kind of just go over, um, pass through this. But, you know, growers that are commercially growing onions, they're going to try to plant as early as possible. And they do it in these double rows as you can see in the picture, because onions, they kind of like to be by each other and do much better. And they're really wimpy getting out of out of the ground. So they need as much help as possible. Um, some will do transplants, but to go and get um, put through transplants, you need to start those eight to nine weeks in a greenhouse or indoor with adequate lighting. Um, and you have to really um be careful that you don't um have any vernalization occur and that's also true with those sets uh the uh, and i think I, i'll go over that in a little bit the sets are next um this can be costly at one time the growers uh were there, there are some growers that use actually transplants because you have they're already growing some other vegetables and they have a vegetable transplanter. And so this works out quite well. This also goes and gets them a, a very early market um, because the transplants will be um, just as early as sets. So they can get an earlier market and thus um, get a better price or they'll do it for those late maturing Spanish types in more of these um, more Northern states. As far as sets, if you're gonna um, use sets, you wanna have them be less than a half inch in diameter. Uh, if you happen to go and have a few of those that are larger, usually what they're what you can do is just use those for green onions. And the reason I'm saying this is because um, if they're larger than that half inch diameter, they've been put into a cooler and shipped to wherever for these garden centers or box stores to go and sell. And if they have, if they're larger than that half inch diameter, they probably have gone through the juvenile stage and thus can be vernalized 
to think they should flower. So those larger ones are going to probably uh, go and flower on you, which is something that you don't want with onion. So spacing, um, we've kind of talked about that. Weed control uh, in commercial, it's um, very rigorous. Onion are just like garlic. They just don't ever canopy. So weed control is really, really important. But, you know, all the alliums have a very fibrous, shallow root system. So you have to really be careful. Um, so if you're pulling weeds, you don't allow those weeds to get really, really large because you'll, if uh, that are growing next to the um, onions, because that will actually um, go and cause some injury and they may just kind of stop their growth for a while, uh, which, you know, in our short growing season is, is important not to have anything that uh, slows things down. Um, so watering, you can see what that is. Fertility, again, just kind of like um, the garlic, you want to more spoon feed the nitrogen. You don't want to go and give too much up front and you don't want to go too long um, with um, fertilizing uh, the, the onion either. Uh, generally, you want to stop by July uh, in your fertilization because if you go much uh, go past you know into August, um, then you end up with onions that have really thick necks, and those tend to be soft when they cure, and you end to end up getting a lot of disease problems. Uh, with that bulb rots because of that large neck that stays soft longer. Okay, so we kind of talked about um, bulbing, uh, and I think I mentioned that um, it's controlled in onions um, by that long day. So location is important. I said it was um, day length and temperature. So this is why um, it's really important that we have the right kinds of cultivars, those long day ones. Um, anything really above uh, Kansas, this would be for long day um, when we're going through that, just because of the day length. And so here's a little uh, table that kind of talks about, you know, how our days get longer. And you can see here by um, June 7th, we have, you know, we're almost to 16 hours. So if we didn't go and plant, if we we're going to go by seed, um, and we didn't get that uh, planted until May, you know, they'd come up and they'd almost by that time be triggered into wanting to bulb and they wouldn't have hardly any, they'd have just two leaves. Um, and thus we'd end up with very small diameter onions. Here's another way of looking at it. Um, so here's our day daylight and then we have uh, our dawn and here's our dusk and you can see how that changes then when we get for daylight savings time and then in the fall, again, but, you know, June 20th then is our longest day at, where we have day length from um, almost five o'clock in the morning to 10 o'clock um, at night. So this is uh, why I feel June is just the most fabulous month in the year in North Dakota. Oops. Okay. Getting almost, oh, I got to hurry. So why do my onions flower? I think I've talked about this um, repeatedly. Uh, and so um, I'm going to go on to leeks because I only have a few more, three more slides. So growing leeks, it re they're really pretty easy, uh, but they need a rather a real long time to, to mature. Um, they're rather slow growing. And, and so... 
Um, most leeks need 120 to 150 days. So you need to start them from seed indoors and then you transplant them early spring. You can, to go in, you really want to have this stalk long and white. This one's not really quite there. I, I mean, they didn't have... Uh, they didn't have these buried very long. To do that, you can either go and throw, keep throwing soil up, or you can plant them in a furrow and then slowly fill in as that plant grows larger and larger. Um, they, the water is about the same as onion and garlic, uh, but they can tolerate, and actually onion and garlic can tolerate cold too. Um, the problem is, is um, that, you know, what you can go, what happens here is, you know, different because you have this bulb only in onion and garlic, you're, you know, you harvest end of July, first part of August. So, I mean, you can't even get to the cold temperatures there, but with leeks, because they're tolerant of cold, you can actually let them and delay your harvest and maybe just pick them as you need them um, after that first frost. Because a lot of times here in North Dakota, we'll get that first frost and then we have a month of really rather nice weather. So the fact that they can tolerate that cold, you can have fresh leaks for quite some time after that first frost. So start them indoors, February, March, you transplant them when they're 10 to 15 weeks old. You don't want to wait too much uh, longer than that because then um, they'll go through some kind of a transplant shock. And if you go less than 10 weeks old, um, they're just going to be so small, very difficult to handle. Before you transplant them, you want to acclimate them to the outside. So about a week where you have them in kind of a protected area where they aren't just getting wind whipped all over the place, but they're starting to adjust to the outdoor uh, breezes more and um, a lot more sunlight. So uh, acclimate them for about a week. And then when we have um, average daytime temperature of 45 degrees or above, you can go and transplant them. Um, and I think, you know, you need, you can't, because two weeks ago we had above 45 for a few days. You just don't go and do that um, in North Dakota because all of a sudden we can have a blizzard again. And so, you know, you want to wait until uh, 30 year average is above 45 degrees for your location. Planting pretty much the same as, uh, the others and we fertilize. So depending on, on the cultivar, you can have some shorter ones that are mature when that stem diameter, the stem diameter is a half an inch. And the larger ones, you wanna wait until that's about an inch in diameter. And then you, again, I would dig these uh, instead of trying to pull because they have quite a root system and I just pulling many times, you're just going to pull off that bottom part. So um, one other thing is try to thoroughly clean before you use, because you know, if you're filling that soil in from that furrow, you might get some soil down into those leaves. And you can eat both the green leaves and this white stem that turns white because of the soil around it. And so with that, uh, just a little bit over. Sorry, Julie. <laughs> That's great. Well, thank you so much. We have a number of questions, so I'll quickly go through these. Um, first, two questions. One's about hard neck and the other's about soft neck. So why are hard neck varieties of garlic best in North Dakota? Um, I I think they're they're hardier. So they, you know, with that straw covering, they just uh, do better. And then we have a question asking about southern varieties, I'll call them, zone seven. Ooh. Are soft neck varieties of garlic better for, I guess, warmer climates? Probably. Um, 
they they actually store a lot longer than hard neck so if you can um and see and that also depends so soft neck have more cloves in a bulb than hard neck so if you want you know if you're in zone seven i would think maybe you would go with the elephant garlic um also i uh, soft neck are a little bit more milder than the hard necks, but um, but I I don't I've never lived well no I have never lived in zone seven so I better not <laughs> better not go and um, talk to somebody who's an extension specialist in zone seven I'd say that's a that's a good answer. <laughs> uh, what could you expect if you plant garlic in the spring? Okay, so there are places that plant it in the spring, but um, the fact that it doesn't, you're going to have to give it, you know, they require those chill weeks, so you're going to have it in your refrigerator so it accumulates those chills, and, and then they just never get as big. So if you want larger bulbs, then plant them in the fall. A uh, couple of questions about scapes. How do you remove the scapes? Do you cut them off? Yes, just cut them off. And, and make sure you cut them off before that. Um, you can see the flower. It's a little, uh, it's like a candy kiss. You want to get it before it gets much bigger and definitely before it opens um, to go. I could have done it. I should have put a picture of that. I could have done that. I never thought about that. So. And then a question about garlic leaves versus garlic scapes. Okay. What's so, the difference? <laughs> um, the scape will be hot around and the leaves are more flattened, hollow flattened leaves. Um, and it will come up through the center. And, and so um, it'll be, and then it'll start to form what is that flower head. And when that starts to form, that's when you can cut it off. And you'll just cut it as close to the uh, plant as possible, to the bottom to, of the plant. And I, I will tell everyone that on our Field to Fork resources page, if you go to garlic, we have a garlic from garden to table that was first written by a previous horticulture specialist and me. So you can also check that. We have a lot of recipes there too. Um, here's another question. I want to leave garlic in the ground around my property. Will it naturalize? Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, I suppose, but it's going to be these little clumps and then if you if you want something like that then go with the garlic chives uh, herbaceous ornamental uh because they they're very naturalized they're an herbaceous ornamental uh and much more set up to i mean they actually have a a really unique pretty humble fl flower so yeah i would go with ornamental onions or ornamental chives or garlic chives there have different names like that um common names but they're alliums that are herbaceous ornamentals that are much more naturalized for a situation very good um the next person asks why people would want to grow shallots that was the fourth one I couldn't think of. Thank you for coming up with shallots. <laughs> um, and they're, they're a, a much more milder um, onion. And they can be grown. Uh, but we haven't been able to. Uh, there was only one of the four cultivars that Sidra um, used that actually had a sizable. They're much smaller. But. You know, some recipes just call for shallots because they want that much more milder. They don't want that pungency 
of of the onion. Uh, next question. When do you pick winter onions? I'm not really too familiar with winter onions. And so That's I'm okay. Gonna, We I'm can gonna go have on to to the next one. <laughs> That's a question for your local horticulture specialist if you're from another state. Uh, if leeks are planted two to six inches apart in a row, can you not have the rows six inches apart? I'm working in raised beds. Ah. And it's the same true for garlic and onions. So the difficulty with a raised bed, you know, so when with leeks, you know, you want to you want to have that stalk that is white. So you keep throwing soil. What we did was we made furrows. And if it's really if you have six inch rows, where, where are you going to put that soil for your furrows to go and slowly fill it in? We had these mounds on each side of the row that we then slowly filled it in to go and get, you know, you're hoping to get six, eight inches of, of soil covering that. So that's the whole part with leaks that would make uh, in a raised bed, having them so close together is unless you, you know, didn't care to have that much white and you wanted to just have a lot more green leaves um if you don't go and put that soil there then you know your leaf your leaf base is going to be right close to the you're not going to get much of the ball part with it but with um onions you know we generally put them about four inches apart because we're trying we're, our aim is a four inch diameter onion so if you have them closer together then they're going to start to compete and actually um, cause some deformity in the shape of the bulb let alone um, probably compete more for nutrients and, and water as well so Next question. What are some common insect pests that will feed on onions in a home garden setting? Well, there is the onion maggot that will affect the seed. And, and that's the biggest, I guess, insect um, that is a problem. Um, otherwise, there you know, you don't have caterpillars or anything like that chomping on them. Uh, but um, yeah, the and but there are some leaf spots. And then, of course, um, some bacteria that if you have bruising that can cause problems. But, you know, the biggest problem is, you know, if you fertilize too much, and you get those with onions, especially you get those larger necks that stay soft and they don't dry down so fast. Then you have a various fungi that get in and start causing neck rot problems. All right. So we'll take two more questions here. Can you eat onions that have flowered? Oh, yes, you can. You can eat them. Um, it's just. You know, that plant, when it's flowering, it's diverting a lot of those um, carbohydrates that it's producing from photosynthesis to that flower. So your bulb's going to be smaller and it's not going to store very long. So, uh, All right. So last question we'll take for today. Uh, can you eat garlic chives? They're not just ornamental, right? Um, so I've never, I, well, I, I suppose a anything could be edible unless it's poisonous, correct? <laughs> you know, but, um, garlic chives versus chives. Now, see, there's chives, which you would eat the, the hollow leaves and, um, and then garlic chives is just the ornamental allium species. Um, and 
it got that common name because the leaves are flat like garlic, um, but it's the different species and it it never puts cloves. It just stays as like a little green onion. So um, I've never eaten them. I've never had the desire, but I don't, you know, I would stick with the the known stuff. I'm sure you could eat them, but I don't think there's going to be much flavor to them. Okay. Well, that's all the time we have today. Thank you so much, Harleen. We really appreciate all your expertise and seeing the latest research that probably isn't even, so you were the first, all of you, to see some of that research. So thank you very much. And we hope to see you next week. I'm your presenter next week. So, um, Thank you again for joining us and please fill out the survey that will be in your inboxes in a couple minutes. So thank you everyone. Yeah.